Yeah. I have to ask if you agree to be uh -huh. involved. With yes, 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 continue. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Massimo. And again, it's great to be uh, back at NYU. In fact, my uh, PhD diploma is standing right there in the back, so you can uh, see it. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, complex fixed points. Let me start with the brief uh, summary and outline of my talk. Uh, so, I, oops, a little bit of a delay. Uh, I'll begin with uh, introducing uh, the notion of uh, quantum field theories. And in particular, I will focus uh, on um, uh, explaining what is the renormalization group flow uh, and the fixed points of these flows that will correspond to conformal field theories or CFTs, and I will refer to them. Then uh, we will discuss a particular class of these fixed points corresponding to complex uh, CFTs. So it will first sound like some uh, strange and exotic object with uh, field scaling in the complexified way. Uh, however, uh, we will see that these uh, complex fixed points appear in the field theoretic description of weak first order phase transitions in many condensed matter and statistical mechanics systems. In particular, we will study in detail uh, a well-known system called the POTS model, which is some slight generalization of the famous Ising model, uh, where these complex uh, uh, CFTs appear. Then we'll switch gears and discuss the electroweak hierarchy problem in this language of renormalization group. Uh, and then we will discuss a particular class of solutions uh, to this uh, problem where the Higgs sector becomes strongly coupled. And again, uh, we will encounter this uh, complex CFTs. Moreover, I will mention that in a completely different physical situation that is in discussion of the primordial cosmological perturbations uh, during inflation, this complex CFTs against play a role. So I will not have time to go into it in the details. However, in my seminar uh, about a month ago, I discussed this aspect and I will uh, refer you uh, there for the details. Okay, let's start with discussing what is a quantum field theory. So uh, field is a set of infinitely many uh, degrees of freedom that can be localized at some uh, point in space or in space time. For example, uh, we can consider uh, one degree of freedom per point in space time. So it's a scalar field phi of uh, xt. So the word quantum uh, in this name, quantum field theory, for me, it is more of a historic term. So initially this uh, mathematical machinery was developed to study relativistic generalization of quantum mechanics. Uh, but in fact, in many situations where we apply uh, what I call quantum field theory, the system can be fully classical uh, or it can be quantum, but in a way very different from what was originally implied. So now quantum field theory is just a set of tools for calculating correlation functions uh, of this field, which turns out to be extremely, extremely general. So very similar tools of quantum field theory can be applied uh, across a range of physical phenomena. Today, we will study examples from condensed matter and statistical physics and from particle physics. I will mention briefly cosmology, but even things like formation of large scale structure in the early universe can be described using a very similar set of tools. Uh, I like to think of the uh, quantum field theories in, in the following sense. Let's consider a space of all possible quantum field theories. Of course, it's some, can you imagine from generality of the subject is some humongous infinite dimensional space that is very abstract. Nevertheless, uh, it's, uh, it's convenient to think um, uh, about them as a whole. So in the space of all quantum field theories, uh, there is a corner where uh, what we call weakly coupled field theory. If the theory is weakly coupled, then its dynamics is uh, described by what we call uh, a Lagrangian. For example, here is an example of a Lagrangian for the single scalar field. So it has some quadratic in the field term and some what we call interaction. Now from this Lagrangian, using a set of uh, Feynman rules, uh, we can uh, find a prescription for computing correlation function. Basically to any correlation function, we can associate a diagram where we connect interaction vertices. For example, here we have cubic interaction vertices and quartic interaction versus, and we connect them uh, with some uh, a priori defined prescription. So uh, the condition is that first, all the coupling constants must have non-negative dimension. 
So let's do a little bit of dimensional analysis. So dimensional analysis is one of the things that we first learn in the physics classes. And in fact, for this talk, it will be a, a central talk. So Lagrangian itself must have a dimensionality of space time. For example, if we if we're in three plus one dimension, it has dimensionality of four. Now, if we look at the mass, mass of course has a dimensionality of mass. So from this, we read off that the field itself must have dimensionality one in mass units. For example, we can measure fields in uh, GeV, in giga electron. Okay, just as an example. Uh, now, from this, we can read off that this coupling G3 has dimension one and this coupling G4 has dimension zero. Okay, so this satisfies our requirement of couplings having non negative dimension. We'll refer to this as something as renormalizability of our field theory. Now, weak, uh, weakly coupled field theory, uh, they must satisfy the condition that the, all the coupling constants measured in the units of uh, energy at which we are. Uh, calculating our correlation factor, some characteristic energy scale or distance scale in any project. So in the units of this energy, uh, coupling constants must be much smaller than one. Then the theory is repeated. Very good. Now, there is another class of field theories that live in our space that is called effective field theory. So in effective field theories, non-renormalizable couplings, uh, that is uh, couplings of negative dimensions are allowed. For example, in our uh, case of single scalar field, we can add this coupling G5 and we can add this coupling GD, which has some derivative interactions. Okay, if we apply dimensional analysis, we see that G5 has dimension minus one and GD has dimension minus two. Again, this effective field theories are applicable if the couplings measured in the units of characteristic energy of the problem are much smaller than one. But now we see because energy here appears in the positive power, uh, this is a low energy description, uh, which is valid. Uh, needless to say, there are, infinite, there are infinitely many of these non-renormalizable couplings and hence effective field theory. Because we can write, for example, average powers of it. Okay, let's move on. Uh, there is another corner in our space of quantum field series where what we call strongly coupled field series. If theory is strongly coupled, there is no useful Lagrangian description. And to have control, we need to have some extra assumptions. Often these assumptions are symmetries. Very important symmetry is scale invariance. Scale invariance is just a statement that some theory looks exactly the same if we rescale uh, all the energies and uh, distance and coordinate scales in question. For example, just a naive example, it is not really correct at the quantum mechanical level, but the classical level in our Lagrangian, we can only keep the kinetic term and we can keep the coupling G4 because it was dimensionless. The theory doesn't really change when we change our uh, units, right? Or do a scaling transformation. Uh, for this talk, also scaling invariance uh, will always imply what we call conformal invariance. Uh, conformal invariance is some additional coordinate transformations, uh, which again leave uh, uh, the theory in question. Invariant form of this transformation will not be important, but this is the term that I'm going to use instead of scale invariant. I'm going to say conformal invariant. So now in this our space of quantum field theories, you see we have some islands where this uh, conformal field theories or CFTs live. So for CFTs operators, uh, instead of fields, we usually talk about operators. So operators, these are basically directions or like tangent vectors uh, in this uh, theory space. Okay. Now, uh, if so basically, if we have a weakly coupled theory, I can talk uh, equivalent in terms of fields and an operators. But in the strongly coupled uh, uh, corner that will be of interest for me, only operators uh, exist. Now, conformal symmetry leads to very powerful constraints on how these correlation functions of these uh, operators uh, can behave. In particular, it is important to classify all operators uh, with the scaling dimension, or just uh, how they transform uh, under this uh, scaling transformation, which is the symmetry uh, in all of these points. So when we rescale our coordinates, all operators, they also rescale, okay, uh, with, uh, uh, with some power here, uh, delta O. And uh, as I uh, mentioned briefly, it is important uh, whether the scaling law, dimensionality of the operator, you can see of this uh, uh, scaling dimensions, basically the, uh, in which units this operator is measured. 
if this dimension is bigger than the space-time dimension, the operator is called irrelevant. If it's equal, it's what's called marginal. And if it's smaller, uh, it is called relevant. So especially these relevant operators are going to play an important role. OK, uh, so uh, we are uh, finally getting uh, closer to a, a discussion of the renormalization group flows. So the renormalization group flow is a trajectory in the space of quantum field series generated uh, by changing the energy scales. Uh, naturally, by definition, CFTs are the fixed points uh, of this flow. Now, uh, here is a subtle point. Uh, a generic non-scale invariant quantum field theory represents uh, energy flow, okay? So in principle, any point in my space, which is a QFT is already uh, energy flow. However, it is useful to think of a subset of degrees of freedom relevant at certain energy scales as of a separate quantum field theory. So you see, because I start with infinitely many uh, degrees of freedom, if I just focus on degrees of freedom uh, that are relevant at certain energy scale, there's also infinitely many degrees of freedom, there is also a QFT. So this is why it is convenient to draw a particular QFT as a trajectory, okay, uh, in this space of QFTs as opposed to a point. For example, some uh, quantum field theory X at very high energy can be very close to some uh, fixed point CFTA, okay? So it starts over here. At some intermediate energies that uh, say we're gonna call lambda B, it is very similar to some other CFTB, okay? And then uh, in the infrared at very low energies thing becomes some other QFTC, okay? So then if this is the situation, we're going to represent our QFTX as an entire trajectory uh, in the space of CFTs, even though it is also formally a point. Okay, so this is a little bit of a subtle issue, but uh, I hope uh, that, that, that it is uh, clear for the rest of the discussion. Now, in the vicinity of a fixed point, uh, or also in the cases of weakly coupled randomization group flows more generally, uh, this flow can be described at what we call a beta function equation. So beta function equation is an equation like this. So G's are some uh, coupling constants that uh, define our theory. And the case is that if I'm in the vicinity of the fixed point, there are only finitely many coupling constants uh, that, that matter. Okay, and then the way they change with the logarithm in this case of an energy scale is de determined by some function. It's some, some nonlinear differential equation. Now, of course, if betas are equal to zero, then it corresponds to a fixed point of a flow. So fixed points are zeros of this beta function uh, equation. Now, uh, relevant operators corresponding to positive dimension uh, couplings are especially important because relevant operators just by dimension analysis, they grow at low energies, right? And generically low energy, long distance, this is what we, this is what we care about. Importantly, symmetries are preserved along the renormalization group flow, okay? Now, uh, it's sort of uh, clear by, by continuity of this equation, the renormalization group flows placing close to a fixed point, slow down and generate large hierarchy of scales. Okay, so if the fixed point, if, like in this example, trajectory passes close to a fixed point, then the range of scales uh, between uh, uh, say this point and this point is going to be large. And this often leads to uh, interesting uh, phenomenological effects. Okay. Now, in this talk, we're going to discuss a peculiar situation where the fixed point exists only for complex values of the coupling constant. Let's consider a very simple example. Let's take a beta function for a single coupling constant uh, that is equal minus delta minus lambda squared. And then we assume that both lambda, the coupling constant, uh, and this parameter delta uh, are small, okay? Of course, this equation doesn't have any zeros for real lambda, but it has zeros for complex lambda equal plus or O minus uh, I squared of delta. So if we look at the flow in this complexified value of the coupling constant, so the real RG flow that we care about, because we care about real coupling, goes along this way. Uh, however, there are two fixed points in a complex plane. Now, in this uh, complex plane, the uh, operator, that uh, uh, corresponds to this coupling constant has complex anomalous dimensions. It's like we have an operator that, uh, that measures in GV, for example, in four plus I point one, something like this. Sounds very exotic, okay? However, we'll see uh, that, uh, that uh, these fixed points appear in many interesting physical situations. 
just to make uh, explicit this point about hierarchy of scales, we can calculate uh, how much change of energy it takes to travel along this trajectory. That's just exponent of an integral of one of a beta function. This is uh, becomes equal to exponent of pi over square root of delta. So you see, if delta is a small number, we generate an exponentially large hierarchy of scales uh, between this point and this point. This is uh, what's going to be important uh, later in the talk. Let us now move on from this abstract discussion and consider our first example, uh, which is a, uh, a Q state Pots model. Now, let me introduce the model. Uh, this is just a model of uh, statistical mechanics. So we, in, in, we imagine some system of classical spins on, uh, for example, some square lattice uh, in two dimensions. And uh, then we calculate their uh, thermal partition function. Okay, so this is model. So there is a very famous, uh, I hope most of, uh, most of you probably heard about the Ising model. Okay, when the spin can take, uh, uh, can go either up or down, take one of the two values and Hamiltonian is just, uh, uh, we, we get some improvement uh, in energy if neighboring spins uh, have the same uh, point in the same direction. So Pot's model, spin definition uh, of the Pot's model is just a simple generalization of Ising model where the spin variable can take one of the Q variables. Uh, one of the Q values, okay? And again, it's the same, uh, same interaction term. When the two spins, two neighboring spins are aligned, uh, we get some uh, benefit in energy, right? We get some negative energy. And then the partition function is as usual, just a uh, weighted sum over all possible spin configurations. Now this model has SQ permutation symmetry, which is uh, 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 more or less obvious. Uh, what is less obvious is that there is an alternative, what is, what is called cluster definition. So instead of uh, growing spins, uh, uh, drawing spins on the lattice, we, ca we can take the same lattice and draw what's called bone configuration, which is just connect lattice points uh, by bone. So now each uh, cluster configuration has the following weight. It is V to the number of bones times Q to the number of uh, connected clusters. And V is related to temperature in time. Uh, so now the partition function of this cluster model is again a sum uh, over a uh, weighted sum over all possible uh, cluster configuration. It's an interesting, uh, but rather simple uh, combinatorical exercise that when Q is equal to integer, uh, this cluster partition function is identical to the spin partition function, okay? But now the cluster definition is varied for a continuous range of Q because Q now is just an arbitrary number, okay? For example, there is a Q equal one uh, corresponds to the problem of percolations, right? In the spin case, uh, Q equal one was some trivial model, but here uh, we see there is a non-trivial dynamics when when Q is uh, when Q is not equal to one. Um, anyway, our main focus uh, will not be on uh, Q equal one. So it is known uh, that for Q smaller or equal to four. There is a second order phase transition in this model as we change the temperature. And, and the critical point, correlation lengths diverges because it's a second order phase transition. And in this case, as at long distances, a continuum scale invariant uh, uh, field theory emerges. Now, uh, an important fact is that the renormalization, so we can think of, we can generalize this renormalization group procedure, that is this rescaling procedure, also to discrete systems. But in the deep infrared limits, in the vicinity of a fixed point, they're also described by quantum field theory. Okay, uh, there is a continuum description uh, that emerges. Importantly, this field theoretic description in the vicinity of a fixed point is universal. For example, it's independent of the details of the lattice. Instead of having quadratic uh, lattice, we could have a honeycomb lattice. And instead of uh, having a Hamiltonian, which has, uh, you know, includes energy of all nearing uh, uh, lattice sites, we could add some, for example, uh, cubic couplings. Uh, in the infrared, uh, the physics will be universal and described by the same field theory. Uh, for example, this uh, POTS model uh, is used even to uh, describe things like protein fold. Good. Now, for Q bigger than four, instead, the phase transition is first order. That is, correlation length is finite. However, for Q somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat larger than four, say for Q equal five, it is very, very large. So correlation length uh, is 2,500 lattice units. It's known from some Monte Carlo simulations and also from some analytic techniques. 
Are our field theory methods useful in this case? It's not a traditional thing to apply field theory methods to study of first order phase transitions where correlation um, uh, length is fine. To discuss this, let us uh, also introduce uh, what is called the dilute POTS model. It, should, it is a slight uh, generalization of the system. Uh, oops, there is a question. Uh, uh, yeah, Galenis, the dimension in this case, uh, everything is Euclidean, so there is no time, there is just space, and dimension of field theory is the same as dimension on the lattice. For example, in what I'm discussing now, the lattice is uh, two dimensional, so I'm getting a two dimensional field theory. Uh, thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, now, uh, so in this dilute post model, we also allow some vacancies on our lattice. Okay, uh, it is also known that there is also a second order phase transition in this model. Uh, hence, uh, there is another continuity. Now, uh, as we discussed above, uh, fixed points of RG flows or critical points in the terms of stat-max systems correspond to conformal field theory. Now, let us draw uh, what go back to our abstract discussion of the uh, space of uh, all conformal field theories and see how this uh, POTS model, the critical POTS model and the three critical POTS model, the one with uh, uh, vacancies, uh, what do they do in the space of uh, quantum field theory? So it turns out that they, 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 they trace these two lines of fixed points, okay? So when I change the parameter, my parameter Q, uh, these fixed points, they, uh, they correspond to lines of fixed points, okay? The two families of conformal field theories. For example, uh, as, as I mentioned above, when Q is equal to two, here we just get the criticalizing model, okay? The very famous uh, C equal one half uh, minimal model. But uh, for the idea is that for generic Q, uh, this theory is defined uh, some two-dimensional uh, CFTs. They're more complicated. But the spectrum of all the scaling dimension, these theories, how different quantities uh, in this series scale, uh, if, we, uh, if we apply our scaling transformation, we change our units, are known uh, since this uh, classic paper. So now, at Q equal four, two fixed points merge. Okay. And what happens is that they go in the complex plane. Okay. To see this, we can study the beta function in the vicinity of this point. Again, it is uh, known uh, by, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from solutions uh, of this model. And the beta function has this form that we anticipated. Uh, there is one operator that dominates the normalization group flow in the vicinity of this point. And it's beta function for Q close to four looks like four minus Q minus lambda squared. So you see when Q is smaller than four, there are two fixed points, two zero of this beta function. When Q is bigger than four, zeros are in the complex plane, okay? Very good. So scaling dimensions of all operators over here on this branch is complexified. So it is this, uh, so that if we do the small parameter delta, which is square root of Q minus four, then some uh, uh, examples of say energy operator scales in the following way. You see it has an imaginary part and the spin operator also has an imaginary part. Turns out uh, that for Q slightly larger than four, in fact, all the way for Q equal 10, the real theory that we care about uh, the theory that doesn't have any complex scalings can be described as a deformation of this complex CFT by this operator epsilon prime with some complex, with some coupling cost so that is in general complex. Very good. So you see what happened. There is this complex theory that is not of direct physical interest. It's strongly coupled, but it is solvable. Okay, it is solvable using enhanced conformal invariants. Now, the theory that we care about is a deformed conformal theory, but still, because of this uh, imaginary parts are small, our expansion uh, makes perfect sense. For example, we can calculate the beta function of our complex of our uh, coupling lambda along the real. RG flow that describes the first order phase transition. It is given again by this quadratic form. You see, this is just some uh, constant and this is uh, uh, lambda squared. From this, we can calculate the, again, the correlation lengths. And it is something exponentially large uh, when delta becomes small. So this is what describes a huge correlation lengths for beta being close to one. Good, so many observables like behaving on entanglement entropy, correlation functions, et cetera, can be computed uh, in this way. And again, this physics in the vicinity of the first sort of phase transition is universal with respect to the details of the lattice model. 
Now, POTS model is not uh, the only example. Similar phenomena occurs in two-dimensional OAN model, uh, which again can be reformulated for a continuous range of n. Uh, the situation there is similar to post model, but it's somewhat more subtle and intricate how two ON invariant fixed points uh, annihilate in the vicinity of uh, uh, what's called uh, Castered Stauris phase transition. The details of this paper are spelled out in our paper. Details of this uh, are spelled out in our paper with Bernardo. Uh, another example I want to mention uh, is uh, a system of great interest in condensed, uh, uh, recent condensed matter studies called uh, deconfined criticality. So deconfined criticality is a conjectured uh, two plus one dimensional quantum critical point. So uh, referring to uh, Glennis's question now where it's zero temperature, uh, but we have a phase transition that is driven by quantum fluctuation. So we have two spatial dimension now one the time direction is real because we're at zero temperature. And there are two different ground states of some uh, what's called quantum uh, uh, magnets. Uh, that uh, there is a nil state and uh, valence bond solid state. Anyway, for some, as we change some parameter of our uh, magnet, there is a phase transition happening at zero temperature. Uh, and it was uh, uh, conjectured so I'm missing a reference uh, here. It was conjectured by, uh, uh, by uh, Sentil uh, and others about 15 years ago uh, that the uh, continuing description of this model uh, corresponds to a, a two plus one dimensional conformal field theory. However, lattice simulations led to results that are contradicting rigorous uh, bootstrap bounds. Okay, so the bootstrap bounds is some tool that is applicable to uh, conformal field theories that can place some rigorous constraints on scaling dimensions of various uh, operators or objects that can appear uh, in this uh, field theory. So summary of this results is the following, that there are two uh, scaling fields, so two scaling operators, they call here phi and O, and a bootstrap bound excludes everything uh, that, uh, that is above this line. Then lattice simulations measured dimension of this delta phi uh, to be 0.62. Now, we also want the operator delta O to have dimension larger than three because otherwise it will not be uh, uh, just a regular phase transition. It's another relevant operator that we have to tune. So it means that we could have to leave somewhere over here, which is excluded uh, by a large gap uh, by the bootstrap bound. So the resolution is that this phase transition is in fact weakly first order, just correlation lengths uh, is very large. And instead it is controlled not by some real fixed point, but by this complexified fixed point or complexified CFT, which can avoid uh, the bootstrap bounds because this bootstrap bounds, they were derived uh, under assumption that the fixed point uh, is real. Okay, so this is uh, kind of the conjecture. And I think by now people more and more agree that this is the situation, what happens in this uh, uh, quantum parameter. Okay, um, unless there are any immediate questions about this point, uh, let me move. Can, to, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, this is Masha, by the way. Um, for, so is there, I don't really know anything about this, but is there any way to rephrase the bootstrap bounds um, or do a similar analysis that take into yes. account this, the fact yes, that it's complex yes. and then show that this is the case? Yes, I think that there is. It hasn't been done yet. Basically, what, what, why is the example is important for, uh, for me is that it shows uh, that these booster bounds do get weaker and they do get weaker by some you know, non-zero uh, non margin. Roughly speaking, there will be some, this, some of this parameter delta and things like correlation length will be exponential in this delta. And you know, by how much we ameliorate the booster bounds will be some power law in this delta. This is roughly the expectation. But yes, it, it can be done, but it hasn't been done. So anyway. Okay, thanks. So I have a clarifying question. So in, in the previous example, I thought the fact that there was this uh, fixed point you know, in, for complexified couplings was sort of a convenient mathematical trick that allowed you to describe the theory for real coupling constant. Mm -hmm. but, but here, are you saying 
Yeah, so same, so same correct... thing. The system we really care about is this deformed fixed point that is, of course, real. Same picture. There is, uh, there is some deconfined criticality of phase transition uh, that, you know, is a function of scale. Uh, can, we, we can draw it this way. Okay, some first order phase transition. And then there is a fixed point uh, that sits over here and over here. Okay, uh, so there's the same picture. And the, and the, the correlation lengths is like uh, time the RG flow spans close to this complex fixed point. And on the lattice, it was bounded from below by maybe a thousand lattice units. So that same, same picture. We're never really in, uh, interested in the complex fixed point. We're interested in the deformation, which is the real thing. But it's convenient mathematically too. Can say again to... why the... mm -hmm. then it, I, I'm, I'm having trouble with that uh, picture understanding why the uh, bootstrap argument didn't work. Wouldn't uh, the bootstrap be yeah, smart but... enough to yeah. deal with that? No, bootstrap just assumes that say all anomalous dimensions are real. I mean, that's what that's because there is something the, the way the bootstrap bound works, there's some inequality and there is something, you know, there's some correlation function. Uh, then there is subtracted other correlation function that bigger than zero. The fact that this is bigger than zero uh, uses the fact that all uh, say anomalous dimensions are positive numbers because like they're square, you know, it's also positive number. Well, here we're getting uh, this uh, uh, imaginary parts everywhere. Say anomalous dimension will have some imaginary parts, you know, and, uh, and, and that changes the calculation. Changes in I'm just saying that there ought to be a, a discussion without having to refer to the anomalous dimensions, but you just explain what it is in terms of some assumption about some relation between operators, which isn't true, that they derived in this. Anyway, I think yeah. I understand. I, um... They use when they <laughs> when they when they reformulate this inequality, they expand in what's called conformal partial ways, and there are some coefficients that must be squares of positive numbers. And that uses the assumption that you know CFT is real as opposed to complex. We can go into more details later, but it will take time to, to introduce all the machinery. Uh, let me. Uh, the point. The, this example more or less proves that something like this is possible. There is by now people agree that there's pretty much no way out other than, than what I explained. Uh, and now we're going to move to a different example through which I will uh, go maybe a little bit more qu quickly because I'm running short of time. Uh, but in this example, it is more of a conjecture that something like this could happen. Okay, so that's what I, I want to make it clear that here we're almost certain that this is the situation uh, by now. Uh, here is going to be more conjecture. This example is uh, uh, brings us to discussion of standard model of particle physics. Okay, so we're no longer in condensed matter world. Now we're in three plus one dimension. We're discussing standard model. So this is the Lagrange of a standard model uh, in a very uh, shortened notations. Uh, these are the uh, gauge fields. These are all the fermions, quarks, uh, leptons, and this is the famous Higgs field. Okay, uh, standard model is on its own and a normalizable weakly coupled field theory if we do not go to energy where QCD becomes strongly coupled. However, when we couple standard model to gravity, it becomes an effective field theory because we add in particular interactions between standard model stress tensor and the graviton, which is suppressed by Planck mass and it is a interaction of a negative dimension. This means that new ingredients need to be added to the standard model at least at some scale uh, below the Planck mass. Okay, now if this new scale is much larger than the electroweak scale, this turns standard model in a very special fine-tuned renormalization group flow, in which sense it is fine-tuned. Uh, in my language, uh, it is fine-tuned because it passes very, very close uh, to some fixed point, which is a free, uh, basically free gauge theory, standard model with all couplings and Higgs mass set to zero, okay? What does it mean very, very close? Because I have some abstract space. I didn't introduce any metric in this space. What does it mean very, very close? Very distances in this space I measured basically by the size of relevant operators. So in this fixed point, uh, there is only one single general symmetries relevant operator, which is the Higgs mass. So how close the standard model RG flow uh, passes to the fixed point as opposed to some generic 
flow that would just go, you know, at some, uh, like this. So how small is this distance? Well, this is just the size of the Higgs mass squared over the UV scale squared. For example, if we take UV scale being M Planck, there is some small coupling, this coupling, coupling constant is basically the one, we get this famous 10 to the 32 number, 10 to the 32 close, okay? So this is the celebrated electric hierarchy problem. It's not a mathematical consistency, but it's something like imagine, you know, you go in the, into, um, in the mountains and you see a rock that is balanced uh, on its tip uh, with precision 10 to the 32. So, you know, this rock actually exists, but this is not quite 10 to the 32. It's maybe one, one part in 10, but this is why we are feeling that something is missing in our understanding of standard model. And of course, attempts to resolve the hierarchy problem led to developments of uh, very important physical ideas. Today, we're going to focus on one of them called walking technique. So idea of walking technicolor is to make uh, the Higgs field uh, composite so that problematic operators uh, basically ceases to exist. So when discussion is strongly coupled, we can have Higgs field, but not this operator, HH tag. So generically, this introduces abundance of new states uh, that we would have seen at LHC. So to avoid this problem, uh, people suggested uh, that this uh, technicolor model is actually a slow RG flow, okay? So it is some conformal field theory, again, deformed by an operator in a sense that, so this is, this is again, in my, in my space of all CFTs, this is the strongly coupled sector and it goes, comes close to some conformally invariant or to fixed point, right? So then the SRG flow is slow and that allows us to separate uh, the scales of new physics to the electrical scale. However, it's not so easy. Uh, because we also need to, okay, the, the, this, uh, the Higgs field belonging to the strongly coupled sector has to be coupled to standard model fermions. Well, now we can do, again, a little bit of uh, dimensional analysis uh, and figure out some constraints. For example, we do not want uh, to have this uh, coupling constant that describes uh, the uh, deformation away from this fixed point to be too small. Uh, because uh, uh, then we are going to back to our fine tuning problem, okay? On the other hand, we want the Yukawa couplings uh, to be order one. For example, top Yukawa is, is really something order one. So uh, I do not want uh, to spend uh, too much time on it, uh, but basically uh, the point is that we get from phenomenology uh, and absence of tuning, we get three mutually ex exclusive conditions they are all mutually exclusive unless delta H dimension of this operator corresponding to Higgs field is very close to one and dimension of this operator O is very close to four. However, this is again, the situation is excluded by Rigo's booster power. So now this, I, I actually took a, a plot from numerical analysis in the three plus one dimensional situation that basically tells us that to have be consistent with phenomenology, we want to be here in this red square where everything that's above this gray line is excluded by booster bound. Not here I copied the plot and I couldn't find the numerical plot. I just redrew it. Uh, I copied the plot that we found in this deconfined criticality example. You see, it's very similar. It is in three dimensions, but the shape of this plot is very similar. Again, everything here is excluded and we want to be over here. In this case, we uh, by now almost certain what the resolution is. It is in terms of this complex safety. So it's natural to conjecture that maybe we can also build a model uh, extension of standard model to, that will address the uh, hierarchy problem and fix uh, this inconsistency of people, what, what people call conformal uh, technical. Uh, good. So again, I'm, I, uh, I'm just uh, repeating myself that the conjecture is that the strongly coupled sector to which uh, the Higgs field uh, can belong uh, can actually be described by a complex fixed point deformed, uh, uh, deformed in this way. Okay, I, I have it here. So it is a complex fixed point deformed by some operator with a, which scales in a complex way under scaling transformation with a complex coupling constant. So probably if I started my talk from here, uh, it would sound like I'm doing something very exotic, but my point was that we found examples like this in start max systems and in condensed matter systems where a very similar situation uh, actually occurred. Uh, so we conjecture that something similar can happen 
uh, in uh, in the extension of strongly cup uh, standard model and I just uh, repeat myself that it is easy to generate here exponentially large uh, hierarchy of scale uh, exponentially with like a small parameter that doesn't have to be uh, you know too small uh, very good known examples where at least at least uh, three or four orders of magnitude come out from all the one number. Uh, Victor, can I, yes. can I interrupt you to maybe, this is Kyle, uh, to maybe ask a similar question to what Ken and Glynis were acting, asking, but in a different way. And maybe you can scroll up just a little bit. To, um, yeah, but in this picture, oops, with the, no, well, sure. The, the, yes. Yeah, I mean, with, with uh, that figure and this one here, with the I mean, if I'm just trying to understand correctly, that the fixed points are complex, and if you want to restrict yourself to the to the real line, then if you're not hitting the fixed point, is it correct that I mean, you're using this term CFT in sort of two different ways. One is like literally a CFT, and the other one is this whole trajectory. So, is the point that if you restrict yourself to the real line, you never hit the fixed point, so it's not actually yeah. a CFT, and that this deformed thing is just close to a CFT. And that's yeah. why, and that's the reason why the bootstrap bounds are kind of irrelevant because it's not actually CFT. Is yes, let, let, let me make it more clear. Yes, so, so QFT is a trajectory, okay, the way I draw it. Quant QFT, which means it's not, not scale uh, or conformal invariant, okay? So this is what I'm drawing here. This is a trajectory. Now, CFT is a fixed point, right? So it doesn't flow anywhere. So it is a point. Right. And those are the and they're complex. So now the bounds, booster bounds, they're usually applicable to CFT. A generic QFT, it's very hard. I mean, people try now, but very hard to uh, do some, you know, booster bounds, especially in the strongly coupled case. So what is bounded at this regal uh, risk level is a fixed point. So now, if you assume that the fixed point actually sits, you know, somewhere on the well, okay, don't I shouldn't be drawing here. There is some, yeah, you know, no, that, 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 direction that sits somewhere yeah, here. Yeah. Then you can also constrain this RG flow uh, very well and exclude, you know, phenomenological reliable models. If the fixed point sits here, you you can constrain the thing, but constraints are much weaker because you have imaginary parts that give you some room, you know, to satisfy the constraint easier. And then also this flow, which is what we care about, eventually is less constrained. Does this does this answer you? Yeah, yeah, that was the kind of my understanding of the resolution, but you said it in a different language before. I just wanted to kind of check again because it came up again here and it seems important. So I just wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank Victor, you. Should, shouldn't I be able to understand this uh, generation of large scale hierarchy uh, just in terms of the uh, real trajectory as well? Uh, in a sense, yes, uh, but uh, it's a little bit, uh, it looks a little bit artificial, you know, why we're writing some, you know, random beta function of the form uh, that we want. So I guess this, this picture of uh, fixed points that, you know, say we know that they exist for some other value of the parameters and that they're real, and then they go in the complex plane. First of all, it, it gives some justification to this procedure. It tells us how to look for microscopic models that satisfy it. And also it's a compute effect, efficient computational tool. Okay. Because you know, on a massive trajectory, we could in principle write any beta function and uh, have any shape. Well, here everything is very constrained. Right, so, so you're saying this is an easy way to find uh, points on a real trajectory, which uh, otherwise look strange, but actually there is, there is a rationale as to why one would uh, want to look at them and they gen generate large hierarchy. Exactly, exactly, yes, that's a good summary. In terms of phenomenology, uh, you would just say, we, we will see nothing. <laughs> the uh, no, no, not, not really, no, because again, as I said, it's not that nothing happens. For example, Higgs is no longer an exactly point particle, right? Higgs is now some composite object. Now, of course, we know from what we know now, it should be close to point particle, but that just means that this operator, uh, delta H, is uh, you know relatively close to one. But then there will be some predicted deviation. I just have some uh, backup slide, but as just in words, uh, say the two, the form factor of Higgs will be some function uh, that is, you know, very special function, some function determined by this uh, complex theory. And then, okay, we didn't probe that well, uh, you know, what is the form factor of the Higgs yet, right? Or what is the cubic coupling of the Higgs? That's that's in upcoming experiments, and this is where we can see something and we can make some predictions. Uh, 
for what it be in our model, what it would be in our model. But, but you're saying it is conceivable that even though you have the exponential hierarchy in running, still those effects can be, uh, you know, around whatever 10 TV can be. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there are, two, there are two windows. One is that we want to look something, you know, what was the main constraint that was pushing this lambda UV? FCNCs, of course, right? And that FCNCs were sensitive to very high scales, right? So basically, that's what that's the exponential hierarchy we want to get. And then, okay, we have new, there's some flavor anomalies, blah, blah. I do not know. Maybe we'll start seeing something in flavor experiments. And then another is more like precision experiments uh, where we probe something like form factor of the Higgs, uh, you know, self and direction of the Higgs. And that's, there will be some small, but uh, functional form fixed corrections at whatever scales slightly above electrons. Good, thank you. But may I ask you, so is there infinite wiggle room here? So like as experiments get improved and improved, will, would you be able kind of to push parameters further and further out or there is, then there will be some bound which will stop you from doing this and you'll- No, no I, I, I don't think it's is the case. Uh, it, well, again, you can model build around anything in principle but if we want to you know be in some relatively simple uh class of models then no first of all these booster bounds they will still kick in okay so they will there's some because we cannot uh uh you know if we take if we make this delta smaller and smaller you see uh, sorry let me uh let me go here oh, it's here but i started calling it epsilon uh, delta in my notation so we want to make this delta smaller and smaller to decouple the flavor physics, right? But if delta becomes smaller and smaller, our theory becomes almost re, uh, real. So in the limit delta to zero, booster bound get resurrected, right? That's what I was explaining to Masha. We get this exponential in delta hierarchy. We want to be very large. And then we get some power law corrections in delta to say booster equations uh, that we also want to be large. So we cannot take delta to small. So of course there is, uh, we are squeezed. But we are doing better uh, than in this situation. And I, I just do this plot more or, more, more or less to scale. So we see how much we need here. It's numerically roughly how much we need here. And we know it is one example of situation where it happened, right? So this is roughly speaking, it's numerology, but it's, uh, uh, this is where we are, okay? Uh, how much time do I have left? Because I think I'm on my, on my clock, I'm 45 minutes, but, but, uh, but there are also many questions. What is... Uh... Yeah, um, you can take a couple of minutes more um, or five minutes more to complete the, your story. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm... Allocated for questions, so mm -hmm. please. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm close to completing. Uh, just basically, I mention one more thing and then I conclude. Uh, so yeah, just uh, to the question of some micros candidate microscopic theory in four dimensions, uh, it is this uh, uh, situation we can consider some QCD-like gauge theory uh, with some um, uh, larger number of uh, quarks and we actually have in QCD and then this parameter NF over NC, this is like an analog of say Q uh, in the POTS model. So we know that for NF over NC close to 11 halves, we have this Benzax fixed point. Uh, and then also for an F small enough, we know from experiment that QCD confines. So there is no fixed point. So again, the conjecture is that at some, there is a line of fixed point uh, corresponding to general X, it collides, uh, and then they go in the complex uh, fixed point. And this is actually a question of some extensive uh, lattice studies, like what happens uh, in the vicinity of this of this point over here, and then maybe we can find some theory that it's phenomenologically uh, viable to be the extension of standard model. Uh, very briefly, uh, I just want to say uh, that these complex fixed points also appear uh, in the structure of inflationary perturbations. All the details of this are in my uh, talk uh, that is on NYU YouTube channel, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Uh, I'm just going to say that the uh, physical meaning of this uh, complexified dimensions uh, is very different. Uh, basically, instead of scaling of operators uh, with, uh, with change of scale, scaling is done by cosmological evolution during inflation. Uh, so it's more like time evolution of cosmological perturbation and then uh, imaginary part of scaling dimensions that seems so exotic in our particle physics examples 
uh, it is actually it is real. It actually corresponds to wave propagation. It's like a real part of the uh, frequency uh, with which some perturbation evolves. Uh, however, mathematical structure that underlies this uh, what I call cosmological fixed point, which is just some uh, structure of inflation and perturbations, is very similar to what we encountered in our condensed matter and particle physics. Turns out that complex fixed points also appear in the study of coronavirus. I do not have, have any responsibility for the content of this paper, but I think the title uh, looks uh, quite uh, self-explanatory uh, without stepping here for and, too long. And not the most, that's the mo not the most incredible conclusion reached by some of the authors of that paper. Okay, okay, let's see, let's leave it there. Massimo, uh, which one are you referring to? The first one or the second one? <laughs> You can guess, I think. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. Let's okay. Let's, let's leave it. Let's leave it there. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's just like I was looking for some other references. I found them using that. It's um, that the you know the complex CFTs became so popular. Uh, okay, so yeah, I just conclude that methods of quantum field theory are universally applicable across the subfields of theoretical physics. And in this talk, we focused on. Uh, what may seem an exotic object, theories with complexified dimensions and coupling constant, but turns out they control uh, the, scaling, the scaling behavior of some real world models, or at least the models that are real and unitary. Uh, examples included weak first order phase transitions in uh, uh, models of statistical mechanics and condensed matter systems, relevant for superconductivity and all that. Uh, model building in particle physics, as well as the study of the early universe cosmology. Stop here and uh, thank you very much for this uh, entertaining and very good talk. So, do you have any questions? Um, oh, I see that Sergey has his uh, hand raised. Uh, Hey, thanks for the talk. So I'm trying to understand better this uh, POTS model example. So if, mm -hmm. if I understood correctly, the statement is that Q larger than four, if I start from lattice model, then there is really no continuum limit, right? Because there is no yes. fixed point. Yes. But, so, but still you're saying there is a continuum theory which can be thought as this real, real trajectory. So how one, one would realize it? One cannot realize it really in that lattice description. So, one should... so, so first of all, okay, so we get this uh, uh, correlation lengths. So the point is that uh, near here, right? So for distances that are much longer than the lattice unit, but much shorter than this uh, uh, correlation lengths, which is, you know, a few orders of magnitude for Q equal five. This is where we can approximate with our continuum description. We use our continuum CFT D4. Of course, what we get is a continuum theory. And of course, there will be some lattice corrections suppressed by L over A to some power, right? And this is something that we don't understand well. We can probably more model them, some leading corrections as adding some irrelevant operators, right? That, uh, that are present at this point. So now how to, uh, what it means to realize the continuum theory, it is a good question because there is a conjecture uh, that the actual massive continuum theory exists in the sense that it's S matrix exists. So there is a candidate S matrix that, well, actually we studied it a bit more in the case of ON model, but it also exists instead of this uh, more, an S matrix with SQ symmetry that has a very funny UV behavior. It becomes periodic uh, with respect to logarithm of energy. So you see it doesn't, from that it also said it doesn't correspond to any normal UV completion, uh, right? So it's a, it's a puzzle. So this theory is, so basically my picture is, what I discussed is the following. There is a lattice fixed point somewhere here and we really study, okay, not, I mean, it's transverse direction. Okay, it's lattice fixed point, let's say, it's transverse direction, there's lattice fixed point somewhere here and this is the flow that we study, right? This is, everything is real in this green plane and there is just some irrelevant operator that depends on this approach. But it actually feels like this whole theory exists. Uh, the continuum massive Q equal five post model, it is S matrix exists and it's a good question what it is. Really. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
-hmm. which a, a, a priori it's it's not guaranteed right it could have been that really there is no true continuum limit for that massive theory but you're saying yeah. there is evidence that, 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 that there is yeah yeah well it, if the fair statement is that for this lattice model there is no true continuum limit there is an approximate continuum limit which you know in practice right, yeah. well but there nice. but there is a there is a still continuum theory, which yes, with this symmetry, there is a continuous symmetry with theory with this symmetry, and looks like it matches all the consistency checks that it indeed passes over here. But it's probably not a conventional lattice model; it's something else. Thanks. Interesting. Other questions? Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. I, I am, maybe my question is very naive, but I am confused with, with this property of having a numerous dimension to be complex, because mm -hmm. if I remember the classic, for example, string theory, okay, basically L0, basically if you apply L0 to a state, it gives you the conformal weight of the state, and there's the operator state correspondence. And basically L0 should be an Hermitian operator because it's the energy. So the eigenvalue should be real and real. And also, I Remember there were bounds that tell you the theory wants you, you want the quantum field theory to be unitary. And H, which were the conformal weight of the states of the operators, have very strong bounds. I think they were positive or bigger than one. I don't remember properly. Yes, but yes. If they can be com complex, what is the phenomenology of these theories? Are, are they the normal CFTs I learned in class? What, what, they dis what is the main difference? Yeah, so, so first of all, let's. let's... Uh, understand that we shouldn't be surprised that the usual intuition that you reviewed uh, correctly, that it gets violated, right? Because what we did, we roughly speaking, considered theories uh, with Lagrangian, you know, for example, let's take d phi cube, and then here we write something like 0.1 plus i times 0.01 phi to the four. Okay, lambda phi to the four theory with complex coupling. Now, if you read off a Hamiltonian from this- Why defi, like, why defi cube? You, you meant defi squared. You, you didn't know- Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, that, sorry, that, yeah, yeah. That exotic. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I just tried to write something naive, an example. Uh, defi cube, but then interaction coupling constant is, sorry, defi squared, I don't know what. Defi squared plus phi to the four, but with some complex uh, coupling constant, okay? If we read off a Hamiltonian from this Hamiltonian, okay, something very simple, uh, of course, it will not be Hermitian. Right, so it violates. Now you ask, okay, why do we care about this? You know why? And that was that was basically the point of my talk that it's convenient to first study this object if it becomes conformal, and then use it as a starting point, deform it back. So I, I roughly do this. Imagine for a second that this was conformal. Okay, then I instead I, I first study this, and then I subtract the i point o o one phi to the four, okay? And go back to real line. But it's convenient in a strongly coupled situation to first solve this because it has conformal invariant and then add this. So that's what I was doing. So when I was writing, uh, you know, say this, this equation, it is exactly this. This is some non-unitary, you know, complexified thing. This is canceling out, this G is complex generically. Here you see it's complex. This is meant to cancel uh, away all the non-unitarities, and again, in particular example, like the spots model, where we have very good analytic control, uh, we do it and we see that it all happens and passes all the consistency checks, okay? Thank you, okay. Let me see, do we have other questions from anyone? Um, I must have missed the part regarding the uh, fixed points in the sky. Um, so, um, but in, in this case, you are studying, <coughs> I mean, if you study, say, the sitter um, or in inflationary model, you are looking at a, a theory at a fixed time, say, at final time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, then uh, th there is why this theory doesn't need to be unitary, right? Because you're working essentially in a Euclidean domain. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so there, uh, could you allow for fixed points that are very far from the real axis? And... Uh, well, okay. So there, if we just take, you know, some vanilla quantum field theory in pure de Sitter space, okay, and then calculate correlation functions at basically asymptotic future, so some simplified limit. So the structure of those correlation functions 
they are they already have you know operators first of all it's some three-dimensional safety euclidean three-dimensional safety then if we do operator product expansion we will find operators with complex anomalous dimensions and there it's not a, not a, this is what we're really interested in we don't need to deform it uh by anything and there it's not a contradiction as you said because unitarity is realized in a completely different way and there it's it's really i mean it's it's easy to understand the physical interpretation of imaginary part uh, of, of anomalous dimensions of those operators, they just correspond to, you know, wave propagation uh, in, uh, in the, the sitter space. And now when we go away from the sitter uh, and go, you know, to some, uh, into some slow roll corrections and get some inflationary background, this will roughly correspond to some deformation of this, uh, of this uh, complex fixed point, but this is not, it worked out well. I, I'm not satisfied, uh, you know, with the way how it's worked out at the moment. This is some work in progress. But what I refer to here is more this limit of uh, pure decider space, which is okay, some good approximation, at least in some inflationary model. Thank you. So in my talk, I uh, drew some uh, some complexified uh, uh, plane of uh, some partial wave decomposition of four point function from which one can read off operator product expansion. And there we saw that generically poles are in the complex plane, which means to, which corresponds to appearance of operators with complex dimensions in the operator product expansion. Thank you. Even if operators was initially real. But... Oh, I see that Glennis has a question. I really love that talk. It's, it's a, it was so pedagogical, I sure appreciated it. Um, on the topic of the possible solution of the hierarchy problem and, and walking uh, technicolor, with the, with the sort of possible brute force approach to seeing if this was a right conjecture, be that first you would use your analogy with the POTS model to try to guess what SUN grand unified group would be pertinent, and then somebody would do like lattice gauge calculations. And if you were right, they would discover that there was some funny business that was going to happen. Uh, it, how would you, how would you prove it was right? Uh, it is, uh, yeah, it is one of the kind of depends what we want to prove, right? If we want to prove that these complex fixed points exist in four dimensions, just, you know, and, uh, that yes, that is one of approaches and people actually are doing it on the lattice. People are looking for this uh, signatures of this complex fixed point exactly in, you know, below the end of conformal window, what is called, right? For some, there is some question, like if you take, say, they take, say, SU3 uh, gauge theory, change number of fermions, and then somewhere around uh, 10 flavors, I think they conjecture that it, uh, uh, it, it, it stops being conformal. And then now kind of we explain to them and I think they believe that they should be looking for this complexified fixed point. So yes, this is one way. Now, uh, if, we, if, if you're asking how do we test if this is the real world, you know, if, this, if standard model works this way, uh, then um, I, would, I think that to me a more maybe uh, a more straightforward way is just to try to derive uh, general predictions for various observables, like we mentioned, you know, flavor uh, things and then some Higgs uh, properties from general properties of this CFT. Because you see, importantly, CFT, it's true also about complex fixed point. It's characterized by two set of numbers, anomalous dimensions, okay, and what is called OPE coefficient. OP coefficients is basically a cubic coupling. So that's a funny feature about CFT. All you need to specify is a spectrum and cubic interactions. And then the rest is fixed. You know, it's very different from usual quantum field theory where, you know, four point function can be very different from what follows from just two, three point function. In CFTs, no, all there is, is a spectrum of dimensions and spectrum of OP coefficients. So now these are some unknown numbers for us, but we can just say, okay, let them be whatever they are, okay? And then from this set of numbers, and it's only finitely many numbers that matter, we can derive some predictions for this Higgs form factor, for blah, 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 that will just depend on these numbers. 
it's true that if lattice people actually construct a model, they will also be able to measure these numbers. But uh, you know, this is just a finitely many coupling constants. We can just keep them free for now and see, you know, what the function plan fits them to something or see what are the function saying that there, Are you saying that there's an effective field theory for the physics of the Higgs? Yeah, let, this, me, let uh, me just 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 show one one equation something we calculated in the pots model but again it can be calculated uh, say say for the higgs you know more complicated we'll need to keep track of some su2 you know but uh, but in pots model we calculated what is here is a two point function of uh, some uh, i think of a of a spin field probably uh, as a function of energy so um, you see okay it's, it's a bit of a mess but uh, no first ignore this factor uh, that is just a power law, right? That's what you expect at the, at the critical point, just a power law, right? Here instead, there is this, uh, that there is this uh, extra functional form, okay? That depends, as you see, it depends on this, uh, what I call the OPU coefficient, some, uh, some, some, uh, some unknown number, right? So something, and then we here we plot it. We plot it for different values of uh, different colors correspond to different values of Q. So you see, it is some functional shape like this. So roughly speaking, Higgs two point function. Now, if we Fourier transform it, we get some you know Higgs form factor roughly speaking, right? Which we can also do. So this is where I'm going. So there is some the functional form is fully fixed. All, all you can do is to change this number, which is again we do not know, and this you know wiggles this curve a little bit. But it is, you know, in one parameter family of curves and, and the functional form is fixed. So, so, some, so this is what I'm referring to. So things like this, you can fish out from this uh, model even, even without building the actual uh, theory microscopically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. We have to see if we have other questions. Yeah, Matt. Well, I'll ask one just for fun. So, so you know, using these complex fixed points, you're trying to explain this large hierarchy, namely the hierarchy problem. Um, there's another large hierarchy, which is the cosmological constant problem. So, can you explain that using a, a complex fixed point? <laughs> uh, yes. Well, we I haven't tried. Let's put it this way. Uh, well, uh, in some you know, in some asymptotic future the hope is that well first i think my my own view is that we need to understand you know cosmology at least in some cosmology the more fundamental language you know without so far really sticking to some measured values of cosmological constant or even measured values of particular pressure model let's try to get some fundamental model of translation for which i think understanding of this complexified fixed point is you know, an essential step, at least it's a trajectory that you can take. You can try to figure out what are the properties of these fixed points, uh, you know, how is unitarity of cosmological evolution encoded, blah, blah, and then try to construct some microscopic system in the spirit of some DSCFC or whatever you name it, that would be fundamental theory for cosmology. Now, if, if that happens, and you know, then we will need to probably reconsider completely our view of you know, measure problem or cosmological constant problem or at least that we could this could happen and then then maybe we can try to uh, start talking about the cosmological constant problem i i don't i kind of gave up i know i thought for some time about trying to think of some really you know models uh, the the kind of standard or whatever effective field theory models for for addressing cosmological constant problem but i i'm not at the moment i'm not very optimistic i think we need something more radical i mean this what we did here is okay maybe sound radical we complexified complex coupling constants but you know we're not so far remote from some traditional thinking about rg and uh, and, and you know and second or first of the phase transitions it feels like for cosmological constant we need some drastic change it's yeah. anthropics. No, I mean, no, to 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 uh, precisely to Matt's, Matt's point, I mean, you need a composite model for gravity because you know you have working technical are derived from compositeness of Higgs, you know, and and that's how you solve the hierarchy problem that some scale, 
your, your fields that are in the Lagrangian, such as the Higgs field, is a composite of someone, and then you're trying to drag the scale high up so that it's consistent with, uh, you know. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. And I, if, I, you, if you were I, to do the same in gravity, so they would, you, you would need compositeness at the scale of 10 to the minus three electron volt that. Uh, well, uh, but is it, uh, yeah. I agree. Uh, I agree that if that's yeah, it's 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 it's, a, it's an avenue, but it's uh, it's it's a little bit hard to to come up with a concrete. Well, also, I'm not I'm not so sure. Do, do you need compositeness at the milli EV, or would we need compositeness at the Hubble scale? Uh, that's uh, oh no no, it's enough. A ten to the minus three would be enough uh, because. Uh, to me, the to me it seems like we can formulate cosmological constant problem, uh, you know, even at in the in the infrared theory, uh, where you know because well, scale, you know, Hubble scale is is much much longer, right? And uh, uh, having graviton composite at uh, oh whatever whole gravitational sector composite at milli v, it's not obvious to me that it uh, will it's, uh, it's, it's not sufficient that's true not every single theory that will do that uh, will solve it it has to take care of the you know vacuum contributions you know like condensate contributions as well not only fluctuations at 10 to the minus 3 EV but uh, yeah this uh, this is, the, I, this I, is I, I, yeah I, did, I, I wasn't proposing to solve that problem now <laughs> I was just yeah, saying that's question implies that sort of <laughs> that sort of thinking <laughs> which is very tough <laughs> I no no that's that I and I, I, I well maybe I wasn't very clear in, in my reply I, I I did I pursued this line of thinking for some time and you know for uh, no, no you were very clear yeah I, we, I, that's how I understood it but, yes. but it's not what I'm doing at the moment but okay we can uh, if you if you have ideas uh, you know new ideas we, we, then we should discuss maybe maybe you will yes. bring me back into yeah. in, into that direction but uh, <laughs> Thank you, Victor. Uh, there could be many more questions, but now it's time for student time. I, I think that oh, we yeah, yeah. have a full minute to, to switch modes. So uh, thank you again. And uh, always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.